And I want to take this time. Uh, I, I was a little busy all week. Uh, I about died in a boat. Um, so, but I, I, I got my dear friend and your dear friend, Mr. Tom, here today to, to bring us the message. So I need you, since we're in the clapping mood, right, just give it up for Tom Fedragon. We love you, brother, and uh, we know that uh, you're going to bring it hard today. <laughs> I don't even know why we're preaching after all that. Amen. Why are we even up here? I, I feel like that I should, uh, wow, that's kind of bright. I feel like uh, I should probably say my name's Tom Pedregon because you all had to say your names, and so that's my name. And uh, I, I don't have anything else profound to say other than that. And I'm not sure how profound it is. It's good to be back here. It's good to be back in church here. J JT, seriously, can we dim those of us a little bit? JT, thanks for letting me, wherever you're at, because I can't see anything right on. He's back here. Thanks for letting me play with the worship team this morning. That was a blast as well. Uh, and that was fun. And uh, guys, it's good to see you guys. I can only see you if I do this, but... <laughs> Since this is being recorded, I probably can't do that the whole time. Who remembers this? Now, my generation would probably remember this more as a commercial for Coca-Cola than anything else. But I would like to teach. There was, thank you. Okay. I'm going to be like Jason this morning. Let's try that again. I'd like to see or like to teach in, in perfect harmony, a, a harmonious World, wouldn't that be awesome, right? We're, in the words of Rodney King, once again, my generation will understand this more than some of you. Can't we all just get along, right? right? And sometimes I think God is shaking his head, looking at us saying, can't you all just get along? Amen. In perfect harmony, the, the world was like that at one time. When it was created, it was created in perfect harmony. And you'll forgive me, I'm a musician, so I'm probably going to use a lot of music references this morning. And if you don't get it, I look it up in the Urban Dictionary or <laughs> go talk to JT. He'll be able to help you out a little bit. The world was created that way, right? God, God created uh, the, the earth and the water and then the animals that he put in the air and the animals he put on the ground and the animals that he put in the sea. And they all lived together. Right, they didn't. You, you didn't have Discovery Channel lions chasing wildebeest to eat. Right, they didn't eat each other and things like that. I don't know how they interacted with one another, but it appears, according to Scripture, they did that in harmony and they did that without any kind of division. They did that without any kind of confrontation. And it was great. And then God puts people on the earth. He puts Adam on the earth, and He says, "Here, you just take care of it." Okay, you name the animals, you take care of, uh, of the ground, and, and it appears, I think you can make some inferences from Scripture that it wasn't all that hard to do. Who's a farmer or who's a gardener in here? I can't see. Who's a farmer or who's a gardener in here? Four of you. I'm using your line again. Like, that's it? Who grows plants? I just spit on you, I think. Who grows plants? All right, forget it. I'm not even using that reference then. It's not easy. Let me tell you, I can kill fake plants. I, I've got in my, where I live, I've got a couple of, of little uh, wire kind of antique looking things that are supposed to hold plants, right? My sister-in-law gave me because she felt sorry for me for a lot of reasons, which we won't get into. And she's, I said, I can't put plants in there. I'll kill them. She said, put fake plants in there. I said, I'll kill them too. There's no way I can do it. And so, and then God gives Adam, Eve, and they live in harmony with one another, with creation, right? And everything was good. It doesn't appear that there was any pain or tears or, or arguing or bickering or, or, or toil even. And then something happened. And, and you guys probably know this story, but I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of it. I'm not going to read it all, and I may just kind of buzz through it. I think we may have a few scriptures on the, on the screen. Um, so the woman 
saw the tree according to scripture. That's how they describe her. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so I'm not being disrespectful to Eve, when she saw that the tree was good for food, she decided she might want to eat it because she was convinced by a serpent that, I don't know, did God really mean that? Does he, I mean, does he really, does he really, does God really say that? I mean, doesn't he just want you to be happy, right? And boy, just look at that food, man. Look at that food. That's like a tombstone pizza or a villa pizza. Look at that food. Let me think. Mm -hmm. I'm going villa. Had villa pizza last night for supper. Right? And so she eats the food. And, and then God comes down and he walks with him in the garden, right? And so this tells me another concept about living harmoniously, right? That God was involved in that process with Adam and Eve in a physical way, even perhaps as he came to walk with them in the garden and everything was good, man. Everything was like they sang kumbaya 10 times a day, right? And everything was good. Then they ate the fruit and then thing changed. Adam and Eve didn't look at each other the same way anymore. Adam and Eve didn't look at the animals the same way anymore. They didn't look at God the same way anymore. And they knew that God was in the garden. And what did they do? They hid. You ever try to hide from God? You can't do it. You can't do it. I play hide and seek with my kids, right? I'm 6'1 and weigh about 230 pounds. You know how many places there are for me to hide? Look, I'm an easy find. I, I'm always it. I'm always the one that has to go find somebody again because there's not much for me to hide behind. That's like us trying to hide from God. There's nothing to hide behind. You can't do it. They hid from God. Anyway, God finds them. He comes across them and he, he says uh, in verse nine, then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked in my head and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman, here we go. That woman you sent me, she made me do it. Guys, have women ever made you do stupid things? Women, have you ever made guys do stupid things? Never, that's what I'm talking about, see, right? And so Adam says, God, your fault, it's your fault. You gave me that woman. And then God confronts the woman and the woman says it was the serpent. You know what she's saying? The devil made me do it. Remember Flip Wilson, my generation again? All of you need to Google this stuff. You're taking notes, right? Okay, they're taking notes. Okay, you need to Google this stuff. The devil made me do it. Let me, let me tell you something. This is just a little side note. It's a little extra. So find the offering tray when you're done. Put a little bit more in there. Okay, it's a little extra. The devil cannot make you do anything. He can't make you do anything. He can tempt you to do things. He can entice you. He can make things look really, really good like that fruit on that tree. But he can't make you do it. So if you're using that for an excuse, lame, Right? Here's the other excuse that was used. God, it's your fault. You know how many times I've heard this when I was in ministry? You know how many times I've heard this since I left vocational ministry? That's why God made me. He made me a smart aleck. He made me rude. He made me inconsiderate. He made me greedy. He made me prideful. He made me blah, 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 blah. You just keep on going, right? That's just the way God made me. So you're just going to take it or leave it. It's the way old Tom is. Take it or leave it, right? God, did, I can't see you. I like to be able to see you. God did not create you to be that way. You can't blame it on him. Once again, you have a choice. But one thing that I want to talk about this morning, I need to keep moving here because Jason stole some of my time. So I need to keep moving here a little bit. One of the things that, that was also created by this event is division. Division and division in and of itself doesn't have to be a bad thing, does it? There are things in, in our life and there are things in our culture, there are divisions that are a very good thing. If you drive on the road, lane markings are a good thing. That divides traffic, right? And for all of you who don't know this, because I don't know if it's you that I run into sometimes on the road, but it might be. Those lane markings are for you to keep your car inside of. Okay, not 
the white markings mean that those lanes are going in the same direction. There's just two lanes instead of one. You don't get your half out of the middle. You only get one of those lanes, right? If it's a broken line, you can cross over into the other lane if you choose. If it's a solid line in the middle, that means you're not supposed to cross over that line. The yellow lines mean that the two lanes that are adjacent to one another go in opposite directions. Really bad to cross that one, okay? Solid yellow line, no passing zone. Who passes in a no passing zone? Go repent right now. You need to go to confession somewhere. Jason will be doing confession after church. You need to go take care. So that division is good, right? I would say even boundaries, you know, for states and countries and stuff like that in and of themselves and the reason for the reason which they were created are also good because it's just a little easier to keep a little bit of order in, in that particular area that you did, whether it's a state or a country or whatever with laws, you know, and different things and stuff like that. But here's what we've done with divisions. We've made them divisive, almost the same word, right? We've made them divisive. And so Adam says, that woman, and I'm sure Eve was over there going, I'm going to hit him in the back of the head when he leaves. I'm going, woo, you, when he leaves, <laughs> yeah, you better go do the dishes or something to make me happy because you're going to get it, right? And so Jesus preached to the book of Ephesians, which I love that book. And, and that book, there's a few themes in it, but in my mind, one of the biggest themes in that is about our relationships, right? Our relationship with God, because now there's a division, right? Because God does what with Adam and Eve at the, end, at the end of this story, at the end of chapter three, he, what does he do with them? He banishes them from the garden, right? You have to talk a little louder because I can't hear either. I can't see and I can't hear. It happens, it's a birthday presents, right? <laughs> he banishes them from the garden, right? And so there's a division. And he, what, what does he do with the garden then? He, he sets up guard, right? What does he set up? Some say you people need to read Genesis. You only have to go to the third chapter of Genesis. It's not that far, right? Yeah. So he protects the garden with cherubs or, or angels, right? With flaming swords. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to mess with one when their sword isn't flaming. When it is flaming, I'm out. I'm good. I'll just stay right over here, right? And so there is a division. There's also a division. And so one of the, one of the themes from the book of Ephesians is our relationship with God. Our relationship with Jesus Christ, right? The, Ephesians also talks about what else? Our relationship with one another, one another. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50, the scripture says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded his spirit, which means he passed away, right? He died on the cross. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And I think sometimes we lose that in the story of the crucifixion. The story of the crucifixion is interesting because it is a story of absolute horror and terror and, and unjust stuff to a degree we can't even imagine. But it's also a story of beauty, isn't it? It's also a story of love. It's also a story of caring and compassion and grace and mercy and all of those things. And I think sometimes in that story, we lose, we lose this, this event right here where it says the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. That veil was the, was the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, which is where God resided with the holy place, right? Which where people could enter and then only priests could enter, right? And, and there was a distinct separation and that veil is torn. And you know what that means for you and me now? You've got that figured out that you, there's no separation anymore or there doesn't have to be. Let's, let's leave it at that. There doesn't have to be a separation anymore that we are allowed now into the presence of God. I don't care where you're at. I don't care who you are. And Paul's going to talk about this in Ephesians, the latter part of chapter 2. Let's get ahead and get there and get moving on this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. <laughs> Thank you for the last minute scripture on the, uh, on the uh, slides too, by the way. It's awesome. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Therefore, remember that once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision... 
uh, made in the flesh by his hands, that at a time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you once, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, so here's what Paul's saying. The Gentiles and the Hebrew nation, the Jews and the Gentiles did not like each other. And so there's a division, right? And, and I know it's all, you know, fashionable just to say, well, people are people and I just love everybody. Do you? Really? Really? Because I don't. Well, I love everybody. I don't like everybody. Oh, I don't like Carlene, but I like Wheeler. I'm trying to get him to adopt me, but he won't. I don't eat that much. So these people that Paul are talking about are the Gentiles. These are the non-Jewish, the non-Hebrew people, right? And they were excluded by the Jewish people from the covenant, from God, basically. They were allowed into the temple, but just the very outer part of the temple, and they couldn't cross into the next part. There was a wall there. Pink Floyd said, all in all, it's just another brick in the wall. There were a lot, there was a lot of bricks, right, in the temple. A lot of music stuff. A lot of bricks in the temple, right? And they weren't even allowed past just the, kind of the very outside of the temple. And I'm sure that if the Jewish people would have, would have had their druthers, they probably wouldn't even have made it that far in. They were excluded because of who they were, because of their nationality, because of their race. You ever been excluded for no other reason than because who you are or maybe where you're from? It's, it's, it doesn't feel good, does it? It doesn't feel good to be left out, especially left out of something good, the presence of God the love of God, especially to be left out of something good for no other reason than this because of who you are or where you live. You're excluded. You're excluded. It's like Illinois fans who hate Indiana fans, right? So who's, who's Indiana fans in here? Oh, good. I was just getting ready to excuse you, <laughs> Right? Or like, in some cases, I'm not this way, Cub fans who hate Cardinal fans or Cardinal fans who hate Cub fans just because of that. Or, or, or people who drive trucks who hate people who drive Priuses and people who, you know, I had to say Prius, <laughs> right? Don't know them. Don't know them. I watch a, a basketball game, Illinois, Indiana basketball game. There's a bunch of Indiana fans in there. You know how many of those fans I probably know? Zero. Why would I hate them? Why would I hate them? Zero. So not only were they excluded socially and culturally, but they were excluded religiously as well. They weren't allowed into the temple, which is in the, in the Holy of Holies, which is where God resided. They didn't get to take part in that at all. And here's my fear, and here's something I think that is teachable in this, is that we too sometimes can exclude before we know. Now, I'm going to make a point here in a minute that we shouldn't be excluding even after we know who they are and how they are. But sometimes we exclude before we know, and to be quite frank, sometimes we're the worst. When it comes to that, and that's why we get the rap that we get sometimes. Because we just, we don't, I mean, we kind of want, we're okay with God loving them, but he'd just love them over there. As long as they can stay over there. And, and sometimes, even when they do find the love of Jesus Christ, man, I was so excited. About eight, was eight people, right, who got baptized? Whew, that's awesome. That's awesome. Just from here. I wonder how many people at that holy event got baptized. That's a, you know, when, 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 when God told Job to go to, to uh, <laughs> Nineveh, thanks. I was going to say Joppa, but that's where he ended up. When God told Job to go to Nineveh, you know what he said? I'm going to paraphrase it. Are you kidding me? You know those people? 
They're a bunch of drunks. They're a bunch of cheats. They're a bunch of liars. They're no good. They don't bathe regular. I don't think anybody did back then. They don't blah, 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 blah. I can't stand those people. Why would I want to go over there? I don't want to share you with them. I don't want to share you with them. Anybody ever, you ever had a conversation with somebody about sharing heaven with people? Mm, ouch. I don't want to share heaven with someone like, I don't know, John Wayne Gacy. I don't want to share heaven with someone like, I don't know, Jerry Epstein. I, 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 mean, I can go on and on. I'm not going to bash people because that's not what I'm up here about, but you understand what I'm saying. I, I don't want to share heaven with aunt so-and-so. She's been nothing but mean to me since I've been alive and she's been alive. Why would I want to share heaven? I can't even think about sitting across the table from them. Are you kidding? And we exclude simply because of who they are. And these people had no hope whatsoever because of that. As a believer, that should break your heart. As a believer, that should break your heart. That someone who's outside of the love of God won't even get invited to see about the love of God simply because of who they are or where they're at. And I'm just going to tell you, if Jesus was here today, he wouldn't be here. If Jesus was on the earth today, that was grammatically horrible. Right, Karen? Help me out. You got to keep me straight, man. If Jesus was on this earth today, he, I don't know that he'd be in here this morning unless he was the one teaching. You know where I would think he would be? Where the people are that are broken. Where the people that are not that we're not broken in here, but you understand what I'm saying. Where the people that have never been invited into the love of God, the people have never even been considered in those kind of cases. Where are we at? Where are we at? How are we doing? Are we doing that? Are we good with that? I can't talk to anybody about Jesus. I can only quote two Bible verses off the top of my head. You've heard me say this before, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. You don't need to quote a bunch of Bible verses to talk to people about Jesus. They're probably not going to listen anyway. They're probably going to hit you in the head with your Bible. What you do need to do, though, is just tell your story and how it's affected you. That's what people want to know. How's it affected your life, Tom? How's it affected your life, Jason? How's it affected your life, Jill? How's it affected your life, Jenny? How's it? I'm using all kind of J's right now, aren't I? I'm just going through, just going through J names right now, right? How has it affected your life? Well, I got to move on. For he himself is our peace. He has made both one uh, and has broken down the middle of separation, having abolished his flesh, the enmity. That is the law, the commandments and ordinances, so as to create himself one new man from two, thus making peace, and he is, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting death to the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we, have, we uh, both have access to one spirit to the Father. Here's, here's what this is. I'm going to just kind of sum it up quickly. Jesus is saying that part of the reason I died on the cross and rose from the dead is so that we can be in peace with this. So that we can be reconciled with God our Father. The veil was torn. And now we can be in the presence of God our Father. We can, we can seek forgiveness. We can seek uh, comfort. We can seek peace. We can seek uh, guidance, whatever it might be, and we probably all need a healthy dose of all of that, right? Anytime, anywhere, you have been allowed into his presence. You don't have to be just a member of this church to do that or just a member of, of that one over there or this one over here or that one over there or not a member of a church at all or not even a believer. Uh, it, it, none of that matters. That separation is gone in the eyes of God. Is it gone in your eyes? Is it gone in your eyes? It is in the eyes of God. And if you call yourself a believer, then you ought to have a heart for what God has a heart for. So if it's gone in the eyes of God, that's what this part of this scripture is saying. It also ought to be gone in your eyes. I imagine it was a very difficult thing for Hebrew people back then to accept Gentiles as their equal in Christ. 
Paul wrote a letter about that, about a slave, didn't he? Wrote a letter to the slave's master, said, I know, I'm paraphrasing again, I know Philemon, if you're not sure where I'm at in the Bible, I know that, that he's a slave and I know, but he's your brother in Christ now. So here's what that means. He is no different than you. None. No different than you. You may have a different occupation, may not be as tall, may not be as short, may not be as thin, may not be as thick. Notice I said thick. <laughs> he, he may not whatever, right? But, but in God's economy and in the eyes of Jesus Christ who died for everyone, for everyone, right? It's no different. It's no different. And I think we would do well I think we would do well to adopt that attitude with people. I think we would do very well to adopt that attitude with people. Now, therefore, we're, we're going we're gonna to finish. I can't even see the clock. What, what, time, what time do I have to shut up? Now, what time am I supposed to be done? Huh? That hurt. That hurt a little. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with saints, with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole body building being lifted or being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord and in whom you also uh, are being built together for the dwelling place of God in the spirit. Here's what, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that you are now part of God's family, right? You, you, and, and that's good. And we're building this thing. We're building this thing, this temple for the Holy Spirit to reside. We understand that in scripture teaches that our body is temple of the Holy Spirit, right? But so is our belief. So is our community. So is our, 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 our church family. So are we together. And we're building this temple in perfect harmony. In perfect harmony. You, you come. Jesus was asked, I'm going to close you with this thought. Jesus, because I got a lot more to say, Chris. No. I already got scolded. <laughs> Jesus was asked this. This is so profoundly important to me. And the reason it is, is because it's so profoundly important to Jesus. The wall's been torn down. This, this exclusion stuff, these divisions have been torn down by the blood of Jesus Christ, right? So the, if they exist and they do, and they do, and they do, they're man-made, it's us. We're the problem. Why don't we be the solution instead of the problem? I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. And you're like, yeah, Tom, whatever. I'd like for it to rain money down on my head too. And I would believe in rainbows and unicorns. Actually, rainbows do exist. I'm not sure about unicorns. So I haven't seen one yet, right? But here's the thing. If you always believe like that, it never will. It never will. But one person at a time, one relationship at a time, either mended or created, one person at a time, one relationship at a time, it can if we will. And the only reason that it will never happen, or you say that it will never happen in your mind, the only reason it'll never happen is because it hasn't begun yet with you. And it hasn't begun yet with me. I hate stupid sayings like this, but I gotta use it because, well, I'm about half stupid and it works. You eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? One bite at a time. Not like the Oreo cookie, you can stuff the whole thing in your mouth. We love one person at a time. We ask one person at a time. We teach one person at a time. We accept one person at a time and all their mess. Because let me tell you something, you're a mess too. All right, no matter how good you got it going on, don't kid yourself. You're a mess too. I found that out on Father's Day. 
one at a time. Jesus says these are the two greatest commandments. He was only asked about the one greatest, but he says there are two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, right? And then he says, and the second is like the first. The original language, that phrase literally means is equal to, is equal to, is equal to. So you don't get to make a hierarchy on this. Love your neighbors yourself. Stop waiting for somebody to love you. Go love. You'll make a difference. Stay.